Hey everyone, welcome back to the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. If you are new to the series, it is still ongoing and we are far from completing it. This iceberg has over 1,000 unique mysteries spanning across over a dozen different subgenres. Today we're going to be finishing up layer 2 and then in part 12 we're going to be moving on to the third layer. If this particular video is your introduction to the series, make sure to watch the previous 10 parts as well which I'll link below and in the top right corner. If you enjoy the video at any point, leaving a like would really help me out. And I just realized that I never thanked you guys in a video yet for 50k, so thank you all so much for the support. 50k is just a massive milestone for me, so thank you all so much. Now finally, without any further ado, let's begin. From the late 1960s all the way to the mid 1980s, there was an unidentified Italian serial killer terrorizing the province of Florence. This unidentified man has since been given the moniker the Monster of Florence. Depending on the source, it's said that the Monster of Florence has killed between 14 to 16 people, most of which were young couples inside of their cars. Our first incident took place around midnight on October 21st, 1968 and involved one Antonio Lo Bianco and Barbara Loci, who were 29 and 32 years old respectively. Barbara also brought along her 6 year old son, Natalino, who was fast asleep in the backseat of the vehicle. Partway through the drive, Natalino was jolted awake. The child was shaken at first, not knowing what had just happened, but after a few seconds he had realized that the car had crashed, and in the front seats were Antonio and Barbara's lifeless bodies riddled with bullet wounds. Natalino then ran away from the scene in search of help and eventually when police arrived, Natalino told authorities that Antonio was not his father and was actually one of Barbara's many lovers. Barbara had developed a well-known reputation for being a very promiscuous woman in her small town, even earning her the nickname Queen Bee. It was unclear who was responsible, but many people suspected that Barbara's husband, Stefano Mele, was to blame. It was possible that Stefano may have held a grudge against Barbara since she was seeing other men, but many people believed that Stefano was innocent and that he was actually wrongfully convicted. Natalino's initial story had Stefano being back home sick in bed, but later Natalino changed the story and said that Stefano was with the group the entire time. After learning about this change, much of the public believed that the police were just desperate to catch someone so they coaxed the boy into fabricating this lie. Despite the lack of meaningful evidence, a prosecutor made a case that Stefano was an unhinged and abusive husband that was out for revenge. Stefano was ultimately sentenced to 18 years in prison for Antonio and Barbara's deaths. However, after Stefano had been locked up in prison for about 6 years, another couple was murdered. And shockingly, investigators reported that they believed that the same exact gun that was used to kill Antonio and Barbara was used here as well. Immediately, both the public as well as the police force thought that someone else was the true culprit. Even Stefano began angrily shouting that he was innocent all along and that it was actually one of Barbara's other lovers that did it, but there wasn't any evidence left behind at the scene to convict anyone else. 19 year old Pasquale Gentilcore and 18 year old Stefania Patini were shot and stabbed while they were hanging out in Pasquale's Fiat 127. Prior to their deaths, Stefania notified a close friend of hers that she had encountered a weird guy that made her feel very uneasy. It was also reported by another of Stefania's friends that a man had followed them during a driving lesson only a few days before the murders. Stefania's body sustained just under 100 stab wounds. And for the sake of the video, I won't be going into detail on the other victims just because there were so many, but they were also killed and mutilated in similar settings as the two other couples that we just discussed. It took quite a long time for authorities to realize that all of these deaths were connected. To be exact, it wasn't until 1981 when they discovered a trend and by then about 10-12 to 12 people were already murdered, all of which were couples. One of the main suspects was a man named Pietro Pacciani who had been previously convicted for the rape and abuse of his two daughters. Furthermore, he also murdered a man who had begun dating his ex-girlfriend back in 1951. He served 13 years in prison for that murder. The only evidence that ever connected Pietro to the monster killings was an unfired bullet that was found on him, which was the same brand as the ones used by the monster. 
In 1994, he was convicted, but this was a very controversial decision as there was a lack of evidence and the police work done in the investigation was quoted as being very poor. Pietro was later released in 1996 after a prosecutor took his side during an appeal. And of course, there are many other suspects, but there is one theory that I came across that I want to at least talk about. I find it really interesting, but I also think it is quite unlikely. This theory suggests that the monster of Florence is actually the exact same person as the Zodiac Killer. And very quickly before we actually talk about this, I want to reference a earlier part in the iceberg where we actually talked about the Zodiac Killer. Many of you guys mentioned how the case was actually solved, but the findings from the investigation that everyone was talking about in the comments was never actually officially confirmed. So basically, a group of cold case investigators who worked for the police force in the past have narrowed it down to a man named Gary Francis Post, but the official investigation group for the case has never come out to confirm this themselves. In fact, the FBI and several officials from California even came out and said that the evidence provided was circumstantial at best. So as of right now, there are kind of two sides where one believes that Gary Post was actually the Zodiac Killer, while the other half is still skeptical and waiting for an official report. But anyways, back to the monster of Florence. Around 2017 to 2018, a journalist came upon some details that led him to connecting the monster to the Zodiac. This journalist, whose name is Francisco Amacone, claimed that a man named Giuseppe Bevilacqua had confessed to several murders from both the monster and Zodiac's cases. Amacone went on to explain that Bevilacqua worked in San Francisco as an undercover CID agent in the 60s and 70s, which is around when the Zodiac was active. Furthermore, the timeline of when the Zodiac murders stopped and the monsters began matched up with the dates when Bevilacqua left the US and immigrated to Florence. Additionally, around 1968, Bevilacqua had access to the case files of a double murder near Florence where bullets and shell casings were improperly stored. Emicone suggested that Bevilacqua replaced evidence with spent cartridges from the gun that was used in the monster's murders. In 2020, police requested that Bevilacqua submit DNA to be tested, but in 2021, the investigation into Bevilacqua was closed. It was stated that the inquiry into Bevilacqua was characterized by quote-unquote suggestions, assumptions, and asserted intuitions. So I don't know anything about NASCAR and the only thing I've ever heard about it or seen from it is the left turn meme. So I was really surprised that this entry became my absolute favorite in the iceberg so far. So NASCAR, like any other professional sport, requires one to dedicate an immense amount of time in order to refine the skills needed to compete at the top level. But in sports that revolve around racing in particular, there is one aspect that makes it more difficult to make it in as you need to go out and find willing sponsors to fund your experience expensive journey. And this is why the story of L.W. Wright is so unbelievable and leaves fans baffled as to how he got into NASCAR. Wright seemingly had no money, no sponsors, and his skill in driving was pretty bad relative to other professional NASCAR drivers. But despite his shortcomings, this man had unlimited Riz. Before we even knew what Riz meant, he somehow found a way to race in the Winston 500 at the Talladega Super Speedway in 1982 before enigmatically disappearing from NASCAR forever. So first off, L.W. Wright is probably not even this guy's real name. The only information that we have on him is from the actual event that he participated in and the information that he submitted is more than likely just fake. And earlier I mentioned how L.W. Wright wasn't too great of a racer. Well, many spectators and analysts theorize that Wright may have been some sort of small time racer who tried time and time again to break into the big leagues but had just failed. So how exactly did L.W. Wright finesse his way into the race? Well, he began by smooth talking a man named Bernie Terrell who was the head of a marketing firm. Wright was able to convince Bernie into sponsoring him as he was an up-and-coming racer. Wright claimed that he had previous experience in NASCAR and miraculously, Bernie took his word for it. Bernie handed Wright a massive sum of cash that when you adjust to inflation is over $100,000 now. This money was used to purchase a car, truck, trailer, as well as cover general racing expenses. Wright purchased a car from a racer named Sterling Martin who at the time was wasn't a NASCAR racer, but later became one. So Wright was just spouting the same nonsense to Martin about how he's going to compete in this race and make a name for himself. Now the thing about Martin is he comes from a family of racers.
answers. So shockingly, he just took LW Wright's words at face value and believed him and then sold him his race car. But not only that, Martin also agreed to join his team as well as organize the rest of it. Which is pretty funny since you'd expect someone like Martin coming from a family of racers to actually do more research before investing so much into the guy. Afterwards, Wright got into contact with a Nashville reporter and asked him to promote his race. And Wright claimed that famous country artists Merle Haggard and T.G. Shepard were his sponsors. Furthermore, he said that he already had a team put together called Music City Racing when in fact this was not the case. No one bothered to double check if Wright really was in touch with Merle and Shepard because it's a claim that is so crazy that you would never expect anyone to lie about. So long story short, Wright succeeded yet again in getting this guy to promote the race. Lastly, Wright needed to get a special license in order to race in NASCAR. And as you could imagine, this is normally a very long and arduous process, but Wright literally just walked into this office that issued these special licenses and talked his way into getting one without providing any sort of evidence that he was an experienced racer. So over the course of about two weeks, L.W. Wright finessed himself six figures, he formed himself a racing team, and he got his special NASCAR license. Leading up to the actual race, Wright was able to qualify in 36th place out of 40 people despite crashing. When the real race began, Wright rapidly slipped from his starting 36th position down to 39th. And when Wright was about a dozen laps into the race, he was actually ordered to leave it because he was being so slow. And just to put into perspective how early on Wright got kicked out, I believe in this particular race, there are just under 190 laps. So immediately, the analysts and all the viewers knew that this dude did not belong. Once Wright stepped out of his vehicle, he just abandoned it and seemingly vanished into thin air. Nobody had any idea where he went and none of the reporters were able to stop him to get an interview or anything. L.W. Wright just got his like 10 seconds of fame you could say and then just disappeared. Some people actually refer to him as the D.B. Cooper of racing. In Chicago on February 14th, 1929, seven members of Bug Moran's gang were gunned down in a garage by four unknown individuals, two of whom were dressed as police officers. It's widely presumed that Bugs himself was the main target of the shooting. This event was spurred on due to the rising tension amongst gangs when it came to the control of illegal alcohol traffic in the area. Between the 1920s and early 1930s, the US issued a law which prohibited the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol. A vast majority of the public were upset at this which created the opportunity for individuals such as Al Capone to come in and begin profiting from the situation by illegally selling alcohol. But the largely Irish gang led by Bugs that commanded the north side did not like that Al Capone's gang was operating in the same area. At 10.30 a.m. on Valentine's Day in 1929, seven of Bugs' men were lured into a garage at 2122 North Clark Street in the north side of Chicago. Now, the culprits did not expect there to be this many people. It was attended that Bugs himself would appear in the location with no more than three of his men. Nevertheless, they were all taken out. The four culprits who were never identified gunned down this group of seven with two Thompson submachine guns and two shotguns. Several witnesses reported that two of the men that belonged to the group of four were dressed as police officers. Some investigators suggest that those men were part of another gang who were on good terms with Capone and they were simply paying off a favor, while others believe them to be police officers who were searching for revenge for the murder of another officer's son. And in that group of seven, one of them was Bugs' second-in-command and brother-in-law. Another was the gang's bookkeeper and business manager. After the gunshots were reported and the police eventually reached the crime scene, they found that one of the victims was actually still alive despite sustaining 14 bullets wounds. He was promptly transported to a hospital where doctors temporarily stabilized him and police attempted to question him asking who was responsible but the guy simply said no one shot me before ultimately dying. 
Once news of the massacre spread across the city and the nation, both the authorities and the public immediately assumed that Al Capone was responsible, who was in Florida at the time. Investigators suggested that the straw that broke the camel's back was when Bugs' gang hijacked a shipment of high-end whiskey that was coming in from Canada that belonged to Al Capone. The two sides have been butting heads over the lucrative bootlegging trade for quite a while, with Bugs even trying to take over some of Capone's other businesses, including his dog track and saloons. Within days of the shooting, Capone received a summons to testify in front of the Chicago Grand Jury on charges for violating the prohibition laws. Capone said that he felt sick and he decided to not show up. But it was basically unanimously agreed upon within law enforcement that Capone was the brains that set up the entire event. And we're briefly going to sidetrack to another event that will tie into this. Wisconsin police were tipped off at some point to the whereabouts of a man named Fred Killer Burke, who was a famed contract killer and robber during the Prohibition era. When police raided Burke's location, they found a massive trunk hidden inside. And within that was a bulletproof vest, over $300,000 in bonds that were recently stolen from a bank pistols, two Thompsons, two shotguns, and thousands of rounds of ammunition. At the time, the science behind forensic ballistics was still new, but investigators were able to determine that the two Thompsons were actually the same ones used in the Valentine's Day Massacre. Burke was never actually caught during this raid, so authorities were never able to figure out how exactly he got his hands on those two Thompsons. And aside from those two SMGs, he was never proven to have any sort of involvement with the massacre. There were many, many mobsters who were suspected of being the gunmen. Two of the prime suspects were actually part of the Sicilian Mafia, but they were also not found guilty for the shooting. The Vela incident was a mysterious event where there was a double flash of light detected by an American Vela Hotel satellite. This occurred on September 22nd, 1979 near South Africa. The true cause of the flash remains officially unknown and apparently there's a lot of details around it that has been kept secret by various governments. The Vela satellite itself was constructed with the intention of detecting radiation from nuclear explosions on Earth and in the atmosphere. This satellite was able to detect that double flash in the Indian Ocean, which could have been a sign of an atmospheric nuclear explosion of two or three kilotons. Once news of the event went public, the US Department of Defense stated that it was either a bomb blast or some mix of natural phenomena such as lightning or a meteor. The reasoning was later adjusted to being a low-yield nuclear explosion, but many people were skeptical as there wasn't any seismic or hydroacoustic data available to back it up. Additionally, there was no radioactive debris detected in the area. But it does seem that the majority of people agreed that it has something to do with a South African nuclear testing of some sort. Genghis Khan's burial place is subject to immense speculation and it remains undiscovered. But many researchers believe that it's more than likely located somewhere in the sacred Mongol mountain of Birkin Khaldun. Apparently, Genghis Khan requested that he be buried without any sort of signs to mark his burial site. He even went as far as to have anyone involved executed after he was buried. According to historians, there were over 2,000 slaves that attended and assisted in the funeral, and afterwards, they were all promptly killed by the soldiers who were sent to overlook the event. And once they were all killed, another group of soldiers came in to kill the soldiers that took out the slaves. This new group of soldiers then killed literally everything that may have seen Khan's burial, including any animals. And what's even crazier is that once all of these steps were successfully fulfilled, those soldiers then ended their own lives. There are several other tales suggesting possible ways that Khan was buried, ranging from his grave being under a river to having trees planted over it. About three decades after Genghis Khan's death, there was a story that spread that said Khan was buried with the corpse of a young camel. This camel's mother was later discovered weeping at an odd location, which some thought may have been Khan's burial site. Earlier, I mentioned that many researchers believe that the grave is near a sacred Mongol mountain. And the reason for this is because Genghis Khan was known to visit the location in order to pray to some sort of sky god. And after the rise of the Mongol Empire, only the royal Mongol family was allowed to enter the area. Any trespassers were punished with death.
What you just listened to is the most mysterious song on the internet. Starting from around 2007, people have been trying to figure out the origins of that song, which apparently was played back in the 80s on some German radio station. As the song gained widespread internet attention in 2019, hope of identifying it grew, but no matter how many people learned of it, it was never identified. The song runs for just under 3 minutes and is known by several different names such as Like the Wind, Blind the Wind, Check It In, Check It Out, and Take It In, Take It Out. As I previously stated, the mystery song really blew up in popularity in 2019 when a teenage boy named Gabriel uploaded only a portion of the track to YouTube, Reddit, and several other sites. Eventually, another person named Johnny Me Too commented that they remember the song from over a decade ago and they actually had the full version of the song. The search eventually led to a record store in Germany that carried a lot of material from small indie groups and even unknown bands. But unfortunately, the owner of the store had no meaningful information on the song. And it seemed as though the search was at a dead end. But it was brought to the internet's attention that in Germany, there's a group called GEMA, which requires all radio stations to report every single song that they play on air. It's likely that GEMA has a database with the mysterious song's name. But after being contacted by several Reddit users, a response was never obtained. Kathy Page was a 34-year-old mother of two as well as a wife who was found dead in a car wreck in the early morning of May 14th, 1991. At a glance, it just seemed like a tragic accident, but very quickly, investigators came across some odd details that suggested otherwise. For example, the car itself was barely damaged, the open drinks in the front seat did not spill at all, and Kathy's feet were neatly pushed back against the seat instead of being stretched out towards the foot pedals in an untidy manner that you would expect from an accident. Furthermore, Kathy was not wearing a seatbelt, yet her body was seated and not thrown forwards. Investigators unanimously agreed that the incident was staged. Police quickly identified Kathy and visited her home, which was only a hundred yards from the site of the accident. The person that answered the door was Kathy's husband, named Steve, and the detective was immediately suspicious of him. This was what the detective had to say after his encounter. He said his wife was not home and directly looked straight down the street towards where the car was. Steve seemed to be quite upset. He began to cry and at times threw himself on the couch crying but yet he would jump right back up and we were talking, and there would be no signs of tears in his eyes. This seems strange to me. Once the detective consulted with his fellow investigators, they all agreed on focusing their efforts on Kathy's husband. Steve was adamant that he was innocent, saying, of course I did not kill my wife. The evidence clearly shows that the perpetrator was someone other than Steve Page. Steve also revealed that although his 13 year long marriage with Kathy started great, the two gradually drifted apart. Mainly, she was uncomfortable with who she was, or at least that was what she explained to me, that she didn't know who she was. She wanted to try to find out who Kathy was. Because of that, we talked about separating for a short period of time and allowing her to hopefully find herself. And detectives were very appreciative towards Steve for revealing this personal information, but they would soon learn that Steve was still hiding something, such as the fact that he and Kathy had actually filed for a divorce. Kathy's sister stated that Kathy was moving on in her life and that she was actually relieved to have that chapter of her life behind her. Medical examiners stated that Kathy's body had signs of strangulation and that her nose was broken. Furthermore, there were bloodstains on her underwear and her skin, but oddly enough, there were no signs of blood on her outer clothing. One of the investigators was quoted saying, Kathy Page was not killed in her vehicle. She was killed at another location, cleaned up, redressed, and placed back in her vehicle. We later learned from Steve that Kathy was actually supposed to meet one of her female friends after work at about 11.30 p.m., but it turned out that Kathy was actually meeting her boyfriend. And this is where the entire event really begins to unfold and get ugly. It was revealed through the autopsy that Kathy had sex prior to her death, so one would assume that it was with her boyfriend which did actually happen and was confirmed by the boyfriend, but later on medical examiners also gave investigators a key detail. That being that there was a male partner who had a vasectomy and Kathy's boyfriend did not, which meant that Kathy had been with yet another man that same night. And most people would immediately assume that the other person was Steve. Now the thing about Steve is he actually had a vasectomy several months prior to Kathy's death. And one more thing that Kathy's boyfriend revealed was that Kathy had on makeup and jewelry when she visited him. But when she died, she was stripped of her accessories and had no makeup. 
So police then questioned Steve and he said that they indeed had sex that night right before she left the house. But as we know, Steve is someone that likes to sort of hide information until it's absolutely necessary to be revealed. And according to Kathy's sister, Kathy had told her that there was no romance in the marriage whatsoever and it didn't make sense for her to be with Steve right before visiting her boyfriend. After further investigation and questioning, police came up with the following scenario. Kathy had returned home after visiting her boyfriend and stepped into the shower. Afterwards, she was completely rid of any makeup and had no reason to keep on her jewelry as she was preparing for bed. During that shower, Steve was fast asleep on the couch. But once Kathy had stepped out of the bathroom, Steve woke up and demanded sex to which Kathy refused. This argument then escalated to where Steve forced himself upon her, ultimately strangling Kathy to death in the process. But this is simply a theory, and obviously Steve just denies the entire thing. To this day, police still consider Steve to be a person of interest in this case, and Kathy's family won a wrongful death suit against Steve. So this topic is one that I've actually talked about way back in another iceberg, so I won't be spending too much time on it. But anyways, the uncanny valley refers to a hypothetical relationship between the degree of which something resembles a human and the emotional response that the object elicits. Most of you, if you've been around the creepy side of YouTube, have likely come across the term before and the many disturbing faces that are often associated with it. For whatever reason, when something imperfectly resembles a human, it provokes this un easy feeling of anxiety or revulsion, and scientists don't really know how to explain it. The chart that you see on screen right now is the actual valley part of the term, with a normal healthy person being what we are most familiar with. The concept of the uncanny valley can be dated all the way back to 1970, where a robotics professor named Masahiro Mori mentioned it in his book. Mori used a robot as an example and said that as the appearance was made more human, onlookers actually felt positive about the appearance. But once it crossed a certain point and looked too human, that's when observers felt uncomfortable. And we have no idea why our brains react like this. There are several theories though, one of which suggests that it may be an evolutionary mechanism for selecting a mate. There may be an automatic mechanism in our brains that when stimulated tells us to avoid low fertility, poor hormonal health, or poor immune systems based on the physical features on someone's face. Others suggest that the reason we feel this innate fear is because these uncanny faces make our brains think of death and its inevitability. The brain may perceive something such as an android or robot as a replacement for ourselves and deep down we have some negative primal reaction to that and we feel the need to be cautious. And then there's the obvious bit of the uncanny valley faces resembling someone who may have been decapitated and then their expression being frozen afterwards. This entry is about the strange death of a young woman named Kanika Jenkins who was found dead inside a freezer within a hotel in the city of Chicago. In September of 2017, Kanika Jenkins told her mother that she would be hanging out with some friends so she wouldn't return home until very late. Kanika informed her mother that she and her friends were going to go bowling and then to a movie as a way to celebrate her newly acquired job at a nursing home. But in reality, Kanika and her friends were actually going to a party on the ninth floor of the Crown Plaza Chicago O'Hare Hotel. Throughout their stay at the party, the group of friends shared videos of themselves on several different social media platforms and it was noticeable that the girls were not enjoying their time. A little past 3am, the girls made the group decision to leave the party. At some point, Kanika had split from the group when she realized that she had lost her keys and her phone. And this is where the details begin to get a little bit hazy as depending on the source you may hear different things. Some state that Kanika went back to the ninth floor by herself to get her stuff, while others say that she was left alone in the hotel hotel lobby while her friends were the ones to go back and retrieve her belongings. But regardless of which one you believe, Kanika was left all alone for about 20 minutes. Again, just how exactly Kanika was split up from the group is unclear, but when the group either realized that she was missing or that she hadn't returned for a while, they began to search for her. They scoured the entire hotel, going all the way back to the ninth floor even, but they were not able to find any trace of Kanika. By the time it was 4am, the girls had given up and decided to call Kanika's mother. They were hoping that maybe Kanika had snuck off on her own at some point and returned home, but to their dismay, Kanika wasn't with her mother either. Kanika's mother is named Teresa, and she 
would later inform investigators that she did not trust the story that Kanika's friends gave her. She was quoted saying that it didn't sound right. Teresa also added that all of the friends were clearly drinking and didn't seem to be in their right mind. When Teresa asked them if Kanika had consumed any alcohol, they said that she only had a single drink. This particular detail worried Teresa as she knew Kanika did not handle alcohol well and that even a lone drink could be too much for her to handle. The friend group later brought Teresa back to the hotel and when Teresa asked the front desk for help and to look into her daughter's disappearance, the hotel outright refused. Teresa then requested to view the camera footage to maybe find her daughter, but the hotel staff informed her that only police were allowed to look at it, and they themselves didn't want to look at it either. And this may have been the difference that could have saved Kanika's life. Police were contacted a little over 7 a.m. and the investigation began just around 1 p.m. Police combed the area and searched the hotel top to bottom, but failed in locating Kanika. When police questioned some of the people staying at the hotel, they also failed in obtaining any notable information. And at first, the police didn't bother looking through the camera footage themselves, as the hotel staff had informed them that they had done a thorough search already. However, around 10 p.m., an officer wanted to see the camera footage for himself on the off chance that a fresh set of eyes notices something new. And this officer did in fact make a big discovery. They found Kanika stumbling her way through a hallway around 3.20 a.m. The footage also showed Kanika stepping into an elevator, which she took down to a lower level within the hotel. She was later seen walking up some stairs into a new hallway where she wandered into the men's restroom. Once she had left the restroom, Kanika then wandered into the kitchen, which was being renovated at the time, so there was no one there to stop her from walking into the freezer. This particular freezer was a two-in-one, where the first half was a cooler, and behind the second door was the actual freezer. Kanika, in her drunken trance, had wandered in and couldn't find her way out. Once police were finished examining the footage, they visited the freezer and they found Kanika frozen to death lying on the floor of the freezer unit. During the autopsy, examiners found no wounds or signs of a struggle on Kanika, but in her blood, they got a blood alcohol level of 0.112, which would label her as legally drunk. Additionally, medical examiners noticed the presence of tapiramate, which is a drug to treat epilepsy and prevent migraines. Now, to many people, this incident may seem to have no mystery whatsoever. It was just a tragic accident with someone that was under the influence, but both Kanika's mother and her friends think that there was foul play involved. One of the more popular theories actually suggests that Kanika's own friends were responsible, but this theory doesn't actually hold much ground as there isn't any actual evidence to back it up. There were simply rumors spreading about how Kanika's friends were getting jealous for whatever reason and may have made some poor decisions when they were drinking. Many people believe that when the staff denied access to the footage, they were actually stalling so that they could tamper with it. The room where the party was being held was apparently purchased using a stolen credit card, and obviously there was an immense amount of underage drinkers at the party, as well as the presence of illegal substances. The hotel received several noise complaints that night involving that party, but they chose to ignore them, and the hotel did face major criticism from the public on how they handled the footage. Kanika's family filed a $50 million lawsuit later in 2018 against the hotel for Kanika's death. The suit highlighted the negligence for not adequately locking down the freezer area from the public, as well as its inability to shut down the party, which violated many policies. Throughout the New England region of the United States, there are these old stone walls that were estimated to span across 250,000 miles, but this estimation was made back in the 1930s and it's now believed that the walls are actually double that in length. Along the walls in the region, there are also distinct stone structures that resemble caves or huts. Historians have questioned both the age and cultural origin of the structures for decades. Approximately 800 stone structures that are unique to the New England region have been found. These particular structures have not been identified in any other part of North America. They can range from 15 to 30 feet in length and are typically 10 feet wide and 10 feet tall. There is a certain type of stone structure which has been dubbed a beehive chamber, which has a cone-like shape and features smoke holes which are presumed to be used for ventilation. Additionally, there are shelves and benches that were made out of the stone walls. Some of these chambers are completely isolated, while others are built into hills. Most historians and archaeologists believe that these structures were either built by early colonists or Native Americans as root cellars, smokehouses, and general storage facilities. 
However, according to some, there are records by early New England colonists that mention these chambers existing long before their own arrival, which probably means that Native Americans were responsible for building them. So most of the debate remains in what the purpose of these chambers were. Many archaeologists mention that the interiors are much too complex and well crafted to simply act as something as trivial as a root cellar. And for many of the huts, it seemed like there was an excessive amount of effort put in. So people were wondering why they put so much effort in transporting these large stones up land instead of building these structures closer to their own homes or villages. Yeah Yeah Beepus 1 is a lost slash potentially non-existent video game. The only mentions of the game that we have come from magazines where two separate mail order services advertised the game, those two companies being Played Again and Funko. One notable detail about the advertising is that the game was wrongly alphabetized with it being placed in between WrestleMania and Xenophobe. Several other lost video games come with tiny details that are able to be used to try and track down the origin, but with Yeah Yeah Beavis 1, there really is nothing else to go off of besides these two magazine listings. Investigators have proposed various ideas such as the title being some sort of copyright trap that was supposed to ensnare competing game services that copied or stole their list. Others suggest that the title may have been some sort of inside joke between the two companies. However, that is a bit of a stretch. The most commonly supported theory is that Yeah Yeah Beavis 1 is just a badly localized name for another game called Rai Rai Kyanshi's Baby Kyanshi no Amida Daiboken. Some people suggest that the Yeah Yeah is supposed to mimic the Rai Rai in the original title, and Beavis is supposed to replace the word baby. In March of 2021, a group of investigators came together to try and contact the staff of Funko and play it again. In March of 2021, several people came together to try and contact the staff of Funko and play it again. They did succeed in connecting with various members of both companies, and it seemed that the main takeaway was that the Play It Again company used the title as some sort of fake listing to see if anyone copied them. According to that source, this was a very common business practice within the niche. In June of 2014, Derek and Maria Bratis purchased a $1 million home in Westfield, New Jersey, and the neighborhood in which they were moving into was said to be one of the safest in the state, so the family was looking forward to spending the rest of their lives there. However, only days after closing the deal on the home, an odd letter found its way into the family's mailbox. On the letter, it said it was addressed to the new owner and said the following, 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, Day, I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. The letter also included details on the family's vehicle, renovation plans, and private information on the children. This letter was signed by a person who called themselves the Watcher. Derek then contacted authorities as well as the previous homeowners, and he learned that the family before them, the Woods, also received a letter before they moved out. That letter was very similar to the one that Derek's family got. The Woods letter talked about how there were people watching the home from a distance and included private details that they didn't expect strangers to know about. The previous family did say that they did not receive any other letters like that one for the entire time they lived there, which was over two decades. Derek's family was pretty unnerved by the letter, so Maria and the children made the decision to stay in their old home while Derek stayed in the new one just to make sure it was safe. And as the renovations were underway, strange things began to happen, such as signs being torn out from the front yard. It didn't take long for another letter to arrive and this time it addressed Derek and Maria by name which made the couple all the more uncomfortable. But the scariest part was that the letter mentioned a specific moment where one of their kids was sitting out on the front porch painting. Is she the artist in the family? All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the watcher and have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned 
turned it over to you. It was their time to move on and kindly sold it when I asked them to. After receiving this second letter, the family decided against staying in the house and returned to their old home together. Despite the effort from the authorities and security firm, the identity of this watcher was never revealed. The Broadus family ended up selling the home about six months after purchasing it. But by this point, everyone knew about the letters that the house was receiving, so nobody wanted to buy it. In 2016, the family wanted to actually tear down the house and then rebuild it. But once the watcher heard of this, they were enraged and sent the following letter. Maybe a car accident, maybe a fire, maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away but makes you feel sick day after day after day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet, loved ones suddenly die, planes and cars and bicycles crash, bones break. You wonder who the watcher is, turn around you idiots. This was enough to deter the family from tearing down the home. Ultimately, they sold it in 2019, losing just about half a million dollars in value. Even though they took a significant financial loss, they were happy to know that they were finally safe and able to move on to the next chapter of their lives. To this day, the identity of the Westfield watcher is unknown. How To Basic is a YouTube channel based in Australia with over 17 million subscribers as of recording this video. For anyone who somehow hasn't heard of the channel before, all the videos have pretty mundane titles and thumbnails, and if you take these titles at face value, you'd probably expect a tutorial. But instead, you receive a masterclass in destroying your kitchen, bathroom, or whatever room you desire. Instead of an actual tutorial, the video is shot from a first person POV where they throw or destroy various items including food. And and one of the running gags in many of the videos is a man giving a thumbs up at the end of the video in front of the camera before abruptly cutting to black. In March of 2018, How To Basic uploaded a face reveal video which currently sits at a staggering 41 million views. But instead of the creator revealing their face, the video turned out to simply be a parody including a wide roster of other YouTube creators claiming to be the owner of the How To Basic channel. The cameos included famous creators such as iDubbbz, Michael Stevens of Vsauce, Max Mo and much more. This video was created as a celebration for hitting 10 million subscribers, so to be trolled in such a way just made the audience all the more curious as to what the owner looked like. Various people online came together to try and break down the video to see if there were perhaps clues embedded into the video that would reveal the creator's face. And there was in fact a clue. At the end of the face reveal video, there was a code that flashed on screen briefly that translated to slash watch question mark V, which is part of every single YouTube video you URL. And in the very next upload titled How to Make a Hawaiian Pizza, there seemed to be another clue. If you turn on captions, there will be nothing for the majority of the video, but while How to Basic is seen falling, a caption saying you pops up. There are several other pieces of text that seem out of place scattered throughout other videos, but as far as I know, this puzzle has never been completely solved. In fact, from what I found out, this was supposed to be some sort of ARG, but for whatever reason, the people who were in charge of organizing it decided to call it quits and cut the project short. And as it stands, the general public doesn't know what How To Basics real face looks like. Mokele Bembe is a creature that is rumored to mainly reside in the water, specifically in the Congo River Basin. Depending on the person, Mokele Bembe may appear as a physical, living, breathing animal, while to others it manifests as a sort of spirit. The creature is described as being a large herbivore with smooth skin, a long neck, and a single tooth. And on occasion, it's also said to don a horn on its head. The first ever written description of the creature was in 1909 in an autobiography by famed big game hunter Carl Hagenbeck. According to Carl, he first learned of the creature when listening to Rhodesian locals talk about their journey in the woods. The natives in the area described the animal as half elephant, half dragon. After hearing of these claims, Carl was intrigued and wanted to see the creature himself as he believed it could only have been a dinosaur. Additionally, many locals informed Carl that there was some sort of large hippo-killing animal that lived in the lake. Carl assumed this to be Mokele Bembe. It's not uncommon to hear tales of large dinosaur-like creatures roaming the African rainforest, and after Mokele gained widespread attention, mass media began to sensationalize the myth of there being dinosaur-like animals wandering Africa. The vast majority of scientists doubt the existence of Mokele Bembe and say that more likely than not, the entity arose as a legend based on the black rhinoceros.
Keeping with the dinosaur theme, this next entry asks the question, why does the Tyrannosaurus Rex have tiny arms? The T-Rex ranks as one of the most vicious predators of all time, but has probably one of the strangest appearances. Paleontologists and biologists have gone back and forth for decades debating how the T-Rex used its seemingly useless arms. Some scientists have even proposed the idea that if the T-Rex had evolved for several million additional years, the arms may have disappeared entirely. Now, we should keep in mind that the arms on a T-Rex were only small relative to the rest of its body. On average, a T-Rex's arm measured in at over 3 feet in length and each individual arm on a T-Rex was strong enough to bench 400 pounds or about 180 kilograms, which meant that pound for pound, the T-Rex's arms were over three times more powerful than the average adult human. But regardless of this fact, a T-Rex rarely had to resort to using its arms when hunting. So what exactly did a T-Rex use its arms for then? Many scientists believe that male T-Rexes somehow had a use for them when mating. But due to how little we know about dinosaur mating in general, many scientists don't take this idea too seriously. In fact, scientists have a tough time distinguishing between males and females depending on which species of dinosaur they're even looking at. T-Rexes are also suspected to have used its arms to sort of lever themselves off of the ground if they happen to fall over. This is what most scientists believe to be the most common use for the animal. Many paleontologists state that if the T-Rex did not have arms at all, they would have quickly gone extinct. So most of you probably know of the hit Nickelodeon show, Drake and Josh, which premiered in January of 2004. There was, of course, an aired first episode that is referred to as the pilot, but apparently there's a mysterious unaired version of it too. This unaired version was set to be produced around 2002 and was made before Nickelodeon even picked up the show. The episode is said to have a similar plot, but Josh's dad was played by a different actor. This original actor was the late Stephen First, and he was replaced in later episodes due to availability issues. Issues. Along with some other changes, this unaired version is said to have a part in the basketball scene where Drake accidentally hits Walter in the face with the basketball, which knocks him out. In the aired version, Walter catches the ball and spins it on his finger before tossing it and breaking a ceramic lamp. So talks around this lost episode didn't really start until 2009 when Dan Schneider uploaded a short clip from it showing Steven first as Josh's dad. And for quite a while, this short snippet was the only thing we had on the episode. But in 2022, Dan made a compilation video featuring some clips from the lost episode. People speculate that this compilation was posted as a 20th anniversary of sorts to celebrate that pilot episode's creation. The video itself has since been privated. The Paradox of Tolerance If everyone is tolerant to every idea, then intolerant ideas will emerge. Karl Popper brought up this seemingly self-contradictory idea that basically suggested that a intolerant society could only exist if that society was able to be intolerant of intolerance. If anything arose in life, then tolerant people would tolerate it, while intolerant people wouldn't and would be more likely to revolt and go off to create a community of intolerant people. Karl himself used this paradox as a way to explain why a German public that was full of good people allowed for someone such as Hitler to come to power. This idea periodically finds its way into modern conversations when it comes to social justice. Many people say that the issue with Karl Popper's proposal is that it would result in nothing but self-righteous behavior. This example here explains this in a pretty lighthearted way. If person B dislikes person A, they would be intolerant and treat them poorly. But if another person, for example person C, came around and was intolerant of the intolerance that person B was showing, they would deem it correct to treat person B poorly. And this can go on and on and on. The same person who wrote that example comedically compared it to Twitter, which is sadly quite accurate. This entry refers to an apparent lost adult episode of the classic cartoon characters Popeye and Betty Boop. This short was only ever shown once and never again. Apparently, in September of 1938, the creator of the two characters, Max Fleischer, wanted to throw a party for animators that moved from the New York studio to the Florida one as a thank you. And as a sort of additional gag gift, those that attended were able to view a fully animated video, complete with voice actors, music score, and stylized backgrounds of Betty giving Popeye a quote-unquote extremely warm welcome after he went to visit her in Miami. 
and apparently Popeye ate his signature spinach towards the end. Afterwards, the short was supposedly locked up in a safe at Fleischer Studios in Florida. The lost episode stayed there until 1942 when the Fleischer brothers were kicked out by Paramount Pictures executives, and the short has seemingly vanished after that. It wasn't until 2003 when the topic of this lost episode became widely known. Some people claimed to have seen clips of it as part of a sort of compilation tape containing various animated adult cartoons from the 1980s. It is currently unknown where the original is and what had happened to it. Some don't even think it exists and the story in its entirety was made up. Lincoln refers to a Japanese urban legend of an aquatic humanoid whale creature that is rumored to live in the sub-Antarctic oceans. Lincoln began to gain attention around 2012 when a forum post on the Japanese website 2 Channel was made on the creature. The post claimed that the members on a whaling ship saw a creature surfacing from water off the Antarctic coast. Initially, the crew thought it was a submarine, but as they approached it for a closer look, it immediately dove back under the water and was never to be seen again. Enthusiasts around the internet began to dig for any information proving the existence of the creature, and one person found an image captured on Google Earth from 2005 that they believed to be Ningen. However, skeptics believe this image to just be an oddly shaped iceberg. There was a YouTube video that was published by a Japanese chemical research company that simply showed creatures in the ocean, but around the end of the video, there was a large creature with small eyes and a large smile-like slit spotted at the ocean floor. There are people that believe this to be a real Ningen, while doubters say that it was another animal such as a snaggletooth snake eel. There were several other diving videos that also showed similar large sea creatures that some believe to be Ningens as well. The Sentry refers to a lesser known mystery of a missing woman named Christine Shields Wagner. She went missing on October 10th, 2016 and was 67 years old at that time. Christine was last seen leaving her home in Olympia, Washington, driving her 2004 Toyota Matrix. When police visited her home to investigate, they found that she had left her purse there and when they tried to locate her phone, it was turned off. Only a couple weeks after her disappearance, her car was discovered at the Harmony Farm Conservation, which is also located in Olympia. Christine was known to harm herself in the past due to her poor mental health, and on a couple of occasions, she even tried to take her own life. Because of the state of her mental health, her case has been classified as endangered missing, and many investigators believe that she is no longer alive. The hidden character stone is this large rock formation that has these Chinese characters carved into it, and contrary to the name, this is more of a large boulder than a stone. The characters have since been identified as saying something to the extent of, the CCP will collapse. The carving itself is inside this narrow gap in between two cliffs, which apparently is just wide enough for two people to stand adjacent to each other. The stone was discovered in June 2002 following the cleanup process of a photography group's visit. Prior to that trip, that particular area was rumored to have been completely isolated and untouched by humans for centuries. Over a year later, a group of over a dozen scientists from various universities visited the stone for research. It's presumed that this boulder was knocked off of a large cliff by natural means, and some say that this happened over 500 years ago, while others argue that it was as recent as 2001. The researchers determined that the boulder itself is over 270 million years old, and they found no evidence that humans had carved the characters themselves. But let's be honest, there's no way that the stone eroded in such a way to naturally reveal that message. That is more than likely just an over-romanticized detail that locals tell visitors. The hidden character stone now remains protected behind a thick glass display. When news of the hidden character stone spread, many geologists believed that the entire thing was a hoax. One geology professor named Dixon Cunningham from Eastern Connecticut State University said that the rock is a Permian limestone, but the exposed fractured surface is very ecologically young. And an archaeology officer from the UK is under the impression that there was intense human tampering with the stone. He pointed out how the rock face around the six characters is smoother than elsewhere within the cleft, which essentially means that the rock was cut back, but we still have no clue who was responsible for carving the message.
Morgan Nick is the name of a six-year-old girl from Alma, Arkansas, who was abducted on the night of June 9th, 1995. Morgan, her mom, and friends were spending their night at a Little League game when an unidentified man carried her away when she was emptying sand from her shoes. Several witnesses came forward and said they saw Morgan playing with the other kids at the park nearby, and around the same time when Morgan disappeared, a red Ford pickup truck with a white camper also vanished. Investigators think it's highly likely that the culprit was the owner of that red pickup truck and they reported that the license plates were from Arkansas and that the back of the camper has a bit of damage which made it several inches too short for the truck. The culprit was described as being a 6 foot tall white male who had a solid build and a beard. Furthermore, it's estimated that he was in his late 20s to mid 30s. Once news of Morgan's disappearance made its rounds in the community, an immense amount of people came forward with leads, but unfortunately, none of them resulted in any solid info on the girl's whereabouts. In an attempt to incentivize the public to help in the case, a $60,000 reward was offered up for the recovery of Morgan Nick and the identification of the culprit. The investigation is still ongoing with dozens of possible sightings all across the US. Her family is obviously distraught, but they remain hopeful that Morgan is alive and will one day be brought back to them. Darwin Scott is a name that very few of you have probably heard of, but a name that is likely much more familiar to you all is Charles Manson, the man who is infamously known for being the leader of the Manson family cult. And if any of you guys have somehow never heard of that before, basically the cult worshipped Charles as a manifestation of Jesus Christ and did all of his bidding. Charles was ultimately convicted of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for the deaths of seven others. According to a Los Angeles DA, Charles felt some sort of calling after listening to some Beatles lyrics. He took the term Helter Skelter and interpreted it in such a way to describe a future race war that would end the world. But anyways, back to the topic at hand, Darwin Scott is actually Charles Manson's uncle. On May 27th, 1969, Darwin Scott was found dead and pinned to the floor with a butcher's knife in his home in Ashland, Kentucky. He had been stabbed and hacked about 19 times. It is unknown who killed Darwin though and why. Many Ashland investigators believe the culprit or culprits to be from the the Manson family, and that Charles himself issued the order of killing Darwin. There are also some rumors that suggest that Charles himself killed Darwin, but it seems that he had a solid alibi as to where he was around the time of Darwin's death. Darwin was a known criminal, having been arrested and convicted of crimes dating all the way back to 1933. Additionally, he was an avid gambler who was rumored to dish town whenever his loans or money owed became too large. So it's also a possibility that Darwin was killed by a personal enemy and not someone who was from the Manson family. So this entry has very little information available. All the sources I came across just copy pasted the same exact text from the original link. But anyways, Joanne Rose Rattray was a six year old girl in New Zealand who was murdered in Hastings on July 2nd, 1935. Joanne just got out of school and while she was on her way home, she was presumed to have been lured away and kidnapped. Joanne's parents, David and Hazel, were immediately overcome with dread after hours had passed and their daughter was still not home. They informed both police and their neighbors and quickly the nearby residents began searching the area, but despite their efforts, they couldn't find any trace of Joanne. The very next day, Joanne's body was discovered at Caramu Creek and it was quite obvious that her death was not an accident. The medical examiners were certain that the death was a result of asphyxiation. Specifically, Joanne was being held under the mud in the creek for an extended amount of time. Police were never able to identify any suspects and they also failed to find a motive for the crime. And after I did a bit more digging for information on on Joanne, I learned that there are actually quite a few mysterious murders in that area. There are close to a dozen more murders that I was able to find that were as recent as 2007. The victim's ages varied quite drastically all the way from 14 to 69 years. The victims also varied in gender with some being male and others female. It's unknown whether or not these murders are at all connected and due to the range of the murders with one dating all the way back to 1935, authorities think that they are likely isolated incidents. The Great Unconformity is a chunk of time that is missing from geological records that spans between 100 million and 1 billion years. The term unconformity itself refers to various locations where the age of rock layers makes a sudden leap in time. 
This abrupt gap can be observed in various rock sections across the world and remains to be one of geology's deepest mysteries. In the late 1860s, there was a geologist named John Powell who was conducting research in the Grand Canyon and made the discovery that over a billion years of geologic record had been completely wiped. This particular location has since been named Powell's Great Unconformity, but as I said earlier, these unconformities can be observed all across the planet. In total, there's probably over 10 billion cubic kilometers just missing, which needless to say is an immense amount of history that we just don't have. The two most commonly believed theories are either something made it so new sediment couldn't be deposited over an extremely long period of time, or massive amounts of erosion suddenly erased the rock itself. Jeff is a talking mongoose that gained massive attention in Britain in the early 1930s. A family known as the Irvings claimed that inside their farmhouse was this mongoose that spoke to them. These crazy claims eventually got the attention of ghost hunters and parapsychologists. These investigators wanted to see the mongoose for themselves, but in the end, they as well as other critics deemed the situation as a hoax. They claimed that the Irvings used some sort of ventriloquism to fake the entire event. The story begins with several members of the family saying that they heard persistent noise coming from the wooden panels of the farmhouse. The sounds consisted of scratching, rustling, and sometimes even voices. The Irvings would tell their friends that a creature that called itself Jeff came forward and told them that it was a mongoose from India that was born in the 1850s. Jeff explained that it was an earthbound spirit and if anyone viewed its true form then they'd be petrified and turned into a pillar made of salt. Supposedly, the Irvings had befriended Jeff and the mongoose decided to guard the home. Additionally, Jeff would wake up anyone who overslept and chase off any mice that roamed the house. In 1935, the editor of a weekly magazine called The Listener wanted to look into the story and possibly cover it in the magazine. This editor was named Rex. Rex said that he wanted to remain objective when listening to the Irvings' claims, despite how outlandish the story sounded. The family provided Rex with a supposed hair from Jeff, which was later identified as dog Care. Additionally, the family showed Rex these bite marks, which were also supposedly from Jeff, but those also appeared to be exactly like a dog's. And the Irvings actually did own a sheepdog, so at this point, Rex thought he was being trolled. Several more investigators visited the family, and they all ended up concluding that the evidence provided of Jeff's existence was at best lackluster. Some psychologists suggested the family may have had some sort of condition that made them truly believe that they were being visited by a majestic mongoose. Hey everyone, thank you all so much for making it all the way to the end here. I'm so sorry for the super long drought in videos. In case you didn't see my community posts, basically my PC died and I couldn't salvage any files. So I had to re-record and re-edit everything and to make things worse, if I sit at my desk for like several hours at a time, I start, I'm start i starting to get like neck pain. So overall, the last few weeks I've just been despair. But now that I have everything sorted, we should be back on a pretty consistent schedule again. I also want to give a special thank you to all of my channel members. Thank you to Flack, Hero, Devoured Eagle, T-Bone Steak, Fear the Milkman, Sasha Wise, Minus 5 Stars, and Jerome Reuter. I really appreciate you guys supporting the channel, especially since I haven't been really putting out any videos for the last month. And thank you again to everyone for 50,000 subscribers. I hope you all have an amazing day, and I'll talk to you all again very soon.